Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you um, so much for coming to the Wheeler Centre. My name's Sam Pang, and uh, this is Unexpected Passions number five. Um, any first timers here? Don't anyone here last time? Wow, lots. Yeah, we don't met, we don't get many that come back. So, <laughs> thank you so much for being here for um, number five. And uh, if you are unaware of the uh, the premise of the night, basically it's two interesting, engaging people that I somehow have managed to track down, and we and I talk to them about something that you may not expect them to. Uh, be passionate about, but they are. So um, forgive me, I'm a little bit nervous because uh, the head of the Wheeler Centre is here tonight, um, Michael Williams. Are, are you, where are you, Michael? Is he here? Up the back? Yes, just stand up, Michael. <laughs> just stand up, mate. That's the boss of the, the, the Don Corleone of literature in this, uh, in this city, which would make Unexpected Passions, I think, Fredo. So... Um, <laughs> Please, just as your way out, I, I, as, uh, just as you're leaving tonight, just stop past Michael and tell him what a good time you had. Um, once again, thank you so much for coming. I will just uh, introduce quickly the format of the night. I'll get our first guest up. We'll have a chat. Second guest will join the three of us. And then towards the end, it'll be a bit of a general free-for-all. If you've got any questions, that'd be great. Q&A. I know it's risky. I know sometimes you're at Q&A and there's no question mark at the end of some of the questions, but um, <laughs> let's see how we go tonight, because they can be fun. So let me just introduce our first guest. Uh, she's a stand-up comedian. She's an actor, if you saw her small part in The Librarians. She's a star of radio and television, um, and she's going for heart surgery on uh, July the 17th. So be very kind. It makes perfect sense to me to talk about to talk to her about her passion, which is junior football. Please welcome George Mackencrow. You did work the heart surgery in. What a cheeky little bastard. Well, I thought it was very... I thought I did it quite subtly. And, um, it's very minor. It's the baby. Part. Well, in saying that, Tommy Cooper does come to mind. And um, <laughs> we are filming this, aren't we? Yep. Thank yeah, you, Richie. Good. Just in case, you know. Excellent. If it's your last gig, be good to good. be a... Thank you. No. Be good I to be a YouTube sensation, yeah, George, no, wouldn't that's... it? Mate, I've been in the business that long. <laughs> if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. George, when, when, when is heart, so when are you going in? Uh, 17th of July. Right, I got that right? Yes, you got that right. And you're not performing the surgery, so thank God for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's get straight. Let's get straight. To, well, I'm sure I'm part of everyone. Good luck. It's, a, it's an ablation. I've got a dicky ticker. There's a little bit that's running too fast. Superventricular tachycardia. Everyone has it. It's very ordinary. <laughs> I'll be out before lunchtime. It's nothing. I could do it here today, tonight, really. It's no biggie. In saying that, we are rolling. Richie? <laughs> Thank you, mate. Uh, George McEncroe, uh, yes. comedian, television writer. Yeah, uh, correct. Uh -huh. junior, junior football. Junior football. I am the first uh, female member of the coaching staff at the Fitzroy Junior Football Club. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations. Pioneer. Yes, and I'm an assistant coach. It wasn't meant to be this way. I was the coach, okay? We had a bit of a Buckley Malthouse situation. Right. It was awful. We didn't have anyone to put their hand up for the under-13 Greens. I have three... Well, I should say, I have four children, three of whom are boys. It's not my fault. They all play football. That's also not my fault. So they started... I have one in under-13s, one in under-11s, one in under-10s. Uh, last year, I had two in under-10s, which is great. I concertina the football, to the training, the games. Yeah, nice. Uh, but this year that wasn't going to happen. And we had no coach, so I said, I will coach. How hard can it be? Turns out quite hard. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but, I, you know, I love footy. I have been to football all my life. That's part of being growing up in Melbourne. You do that. And, um, and I'm passionate about junior football. You say you put your hand up. We didn't have a coach. I said I coach. didn't have a coach. I approached the former coach and said, would you like to do it? He said, no, I can't. So I put my hat in the ring and the club president rang me and said, you are now the coach. I said, great. And then the coach rang and said, look, actually, we've got to have a chat about our roles next year. I thought, well, what chat? I'm the coach. Would you like to be an assistant? He is a former v AFL player. <laughs> right. So, and, uh, 
<laughs> and, so we're uh, going to name him? No. And he okay. said, uh, oh, yeah, funny, let's have a meeting. And so we had the meeting and he said, how about this? How about if you play, you can be coach, and then after a few weeks we'll review the situation. Would it be a one-man review? I think that was what his guys said. No, right. no, that won't happen. You either let me co- – yeah, if I take it, I take it for the year, or you can, you can have it if you want it. And, uh, but you've got to let me know. So then he came up and said, yes, he would like to do it. And much to my relief, I've got to say, ladies and gentlemen, as much as I love it, I was kind of pleased. Because when I came home and told my husband that, that I was now the coach, he, he didn't look happy. I think he would have preferred me to say, I've been sleeping with your dad for the last 10 years. <laughs> Quite frankly, it would have been easier on the marriage. What? Um... Because I was lying awake already. I was lying awake thinking, well, I haven't got enough tools. As an assistant? As an, it, <laughs> when I thought I was going, I was going, oh, I'd look through the boys, I'd check them out at training, and we'd done a run. I haven't got enough meat on those thighs. It's going to be a problem. I haven't got enough muscle and I haven't got enough height. And so all night before I'd go to sleep, I'd be planning my tools down the spine of the field of where I was going to place people, and there just wasn't enough height to go around. So this is you as an assistant, George? No, this was when I was going to be coach. Okay. Now as the assistant, well, I'm worried this weekend we're down five players. We're going to have no one on the bench. If anything happens, we're, we're screwed. But that's all right. We're playing Whitehorse Colts. What could possibly go wrong? They beat us last time by 33 points. I'm not saying there was a problem. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I know who is to blame. I'm not going to mention any names. But, Lozer, if you ever fuck it up again like that. <laughs> anyway, he did get concussed. What can you say? Um, Still, yes, that's I, all right. I just, before we let him go. <laughs> yes. He wasn't going to do the job. Then you, no. then it was, was the only thing that brought him out of retirement the fact that a woman was going to be the job? Possibly. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. A menstruating coach was more than he could possibly <laughs> cope with, I think. Uh, so how's the working relationship been? Yeah, no, good now because I defer to him. He's, he's actually a really good coach uh, and a very, very lovely man. So I do, I do like the fella and he does a great job. So good on you. How have the, uh, how have the players who are aged under... Under 13. Under, how have they received? They're fine. It's the dads who have struggled a little bit. It's not. Um, it's it's not actually. I don't. I don't think the boys care. They've had female. T- it's it's essentially a teaching role. That's what you're doing. You're teaching skills, and you're teaching about friendship and failure and teamwork, and putting yourself aside. Sometimes you know. There's a lot going on in football, which is why I love it. You know. It's 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 life lessons. Well, they, they, they said often the difference between the 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 coach and the assistant coach is the coach. You know, it has to be in charge of everyone and really is hard. Mm. But the assistant coach can be more of a, a confidant and can be good yes. on a personal level. Is that yeah, how you, what you found? Yeah, that is true. I do give him a little bit of a cuddle sometimes. Right. Because <laughs> they're so cute. Um, but, yeah, and, I, and they do like that. I do like to know what they're doing. And I do like to say to the coach, don't go hard on him. He's just He was in the pool at swimming training at 4 o'clock this morning. He also plays clarinet. He's got an exam. You know, it's nice to be able to fill in the backstory sometimes for some of these kids. And, uh, and, and most of all, Coach, he's so cute. He's That's so cute. Always, uh, yeah, but, they don't like me saying that. No, uh, no. What a surprise. But the boys don't mind, but the other men don't like it. They don't like it when I explain drills either, when I say, look, the reason we're doing all this is because this builds your core, and if you get tackled, you'll hurt your back less, and you'll be... They go, no, don't, 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 don't explain it. Just get them to fucking run. <laughs> run around the oval. <laughs> They, 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 they talk to them. That's what they like them just to be the authority of yeah. it. And I, I'm a bit of an explainer of why we're doing what we do. Yeah, I, what you do? You think that's soft too? Are you had a no, little? No, not at all. I don't think it's great. You know, I wish there was more of it. But um, sometimes, though, in football, at like a short, sharp message might be the you know yes. in terms of during the game, George. I don't know if. Well, I don't like to do... I think this is their recreational time. My approach is that this is sacred time, actually, for them. Everyone, the grown-ups should all just shush, calm down, and let the boys have a nice time. They actually all want to win. Um, They all are very hungry, and fewer angry men yelling in their faces is probably a good thing. I just think I don't do well when I have angry men yelling at me. It's just a crazy notion, I know. I, I don't know where I got it from. But I have seen little boys at half time with three or four well-intended, red-faced men going, no, what you got to do, Josh? What are you going to do, Josh? Go to the back. When we have a stoppage, what are you going to do? Is your magic? And a kid there just going, I just want to eat the green snake. <laughs> like, just get out of my face. Yeah. 
and they 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 are they get down on one knee and they go you know and it's it is it's mental actually is what it is it's insane these are little boys having a lovely run of the football and good on them at under 11, that is absolutely. Under have, you had to put, have you had to <laughs> take any fa- any any parents aside and just uh, tell them? Uh, Look, we clear had clear marks about what what. No, we had to... a nasty incident last week where I got a bit punchy because um, <laughs> one of the coaches on the opposition was going off at an umpire's decision, and. And I did say to one of my boys on the bench, take some tissues down to the coach's box and then tell, tell him to have a bit of a sook. Go on, just go and tell him. Here's hey. a box of tissues. So, I'm, just, I'm not going to get there punch my head in. Uh, yeah, fair enough. So as an assistant coach, you were supporting sledging. Were you <laughs> that? That's great. Well, I was just saying, you know, just can't, they, they've got to calm down. They're grown-ups. And uh, we, had, we had the other coach was slagging. Mine, one of my boys, Leon, was having a kick from outside 50. And... He wasn't going to make it. We knew he wasn't going to make it. But there's only 10 minutes of the siren. We're being done like a dinner. What did it matter? So he was having a crack. Good on him. Fair play. But the other coach was there yelling at him, you're pathetic. You're not going to kick this. And my boys quite rightly turned to him and said, this is junior football. Why don't you calm down? (laughs) But do you know what happens when you tell people to calm down? They don't. (laughs) And the boys learnt that lesson too. They didn't. He did not calm down. He got more and more aggressive, and uh, yeah. So it, it was. It was an ugly game. It's going to go before the tribunal, before the league. Yeah, we had to write a letter of complaint to the league. It's going to be full on. Anyway, that's all right. That's <laughs> full junior footy. It's all the fun of the fair. How have um, opposition coaches? Uh, Handled the whole situation. I, I call it a situation, George, as if this I know, is a, you know it's like an emergency. Really, exactly. Oh, women with small children—that'll never work. <laughs> When is that ever? Oh, that's right. All yeah. the fucking time. Um, uh, yeah, I know. It's crazy. Uh, it, but, yeah, look, all right. I mean, look, I'm not a good kick. I can't pretend. But I just import that. You know, I had a chat to Brendan Favola the other day and said, would you come down and do a few drop punts for the kids? He said, oh, yeah. So wouldn't that be cool if I could roll up with Fev as long as we kept him away from the drinks? Um, and, and the children, I would and, argue. No, but no. Anyway, he's, look, he's the, uh, <laughs> He's a very nice fella. He's a very good fella and yeah, a very no, good I kick tried, of the footy. You've yeah. got to say, he played to his strong suit. Um, no, I'm trying to get him in one of these things. I don't know. Yeah, no. uh, he, look, he, he, he was very, very good. So, you know, it is an interesting thing. And the reason I really did it was the coach before last um, was a very nice man. But he used to do things like my son desperately wanted to play forward pocket. And that is the glamour position. Anyone who doesn't know about footy, that's where you can kick a goal from. Anywhere else, you got Buckleys, right? So my Joey got finally, after nearly a whole season, got put in the full forward and he took a mark five metres out. We had a set shot at goal, missed, side of the boot. Head wow. dropped. You could, I could feel the lump in his throat from where I was standing. It's all right. He manned up, he shook it off and he took another mark, not three minutes later. Ball came down to him and he took another mark, plumb in front. Another boy said, play on, play on, and he did. And he had another shot at goal and and missed it. And um, we got to quarter time, the siren went, thank Christ. And we went in and this other coach, uh, Zach, who's a lovely fellow, said, all right, all right, boys, take a knee. Take a knee, boys. All right. The thing is, I don't want anyone to talk about Staffy. That's my son. And the 12 points, we should be here by now. I don't want anyone to talk about that. (laughs) I don't want any of you. If I hear any of you talking about the two goals, we should be ahead by now. I swear to God. And my boy who'd been holding it together just <laughs> lost his shit, right? Tears and doing that. <laughs> and, then, and then clutched his ankle. Yeah, oh, no. I can't. And holding his ankle. I was like, oh, do I come in? Do I step back? What do I do? And anyway, this coach, bless him, came over and said, all right, all right, I'll let you go on. I'll let you go on the bench, mate, for this quarter. But I swear to God, if I if any one of these boys said something to upset you, you just tell me who it is, and I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, then, yeah, I reckon I could have a crack at this coaching. I don't reckon it's going to be that hard. How many? Uh... <laughs> Oh, I love him. I love him. He says, all right, boys, take a knee. All right. You know that boy, Luke? He's gone to hospital because he put his body on the line. He's got a broken arm. Okay, maybe it's not broken, but either way. Like, don't break his limbs if you don't even know it's broken. He also says things like, if you put your head over the ball and your body on the line, you cannot get hurt. Yeah. I, I that le- is just bullshit. Nice. 
<laughs> but he believes it when so he it, says it. So these um, these mantras that yes. you that you speak of, I I have heard many of them before. You would have because you yeah, yeah. spent a lot of time in junior what, football. So if you are standing there as a as a clear thinking rational mm. woman. Clear thinking, rational assistant coach. Yes. Do you think that it's your job to just stand in and uh, to just step in and kind of put an end to it? No, it's my job to pick out a pen and paper and write it down. <laughs> That's what I do. That's it. I do. Look, I let them go, and then I'll often come around afterwards and just undo. You know how when you rub someone on the back, it undoes whatever everything's just happened to them. You know that magical trick. Yeah. I do a bit of that, just a bit of a pat on the back, and we just. You know, That's, make it all okay. That just it's reminds me okay. of, you know, being at a nightclub and you're throwing up in the toilet and someone's yeah. patting your back. That's beautiful. It That's is what a you bit do. Like That's that. what an assistant coach does. It is does. a bit like that. It is, it is a funny role, assistant coach, because it is a bit of a mum-dad thing we've got going on, which I think happens regardless. I have had other assistants there who, um, one person, whenever I lay out the cones for a drill, no matter where I put the cones, he always just moves them to a little bit. <laughs> Did just you? a little bit. Yep. Just to undo the lady spell that I've cast on them. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it just cracks me up. Because no matter where I put them, you always just. Yeah. But that's okay. Look, that's well, okay. It doesn't matter. Look, uh, having been to the coach's course, which was hilarious. Whoa, whoa. When was this? Oh, you have to be a qualified coach. Yeah, you had to go and do the course. It was a two day in service. Out at Oakley. This is to be a, a, any, on a coaching panel. To it, get your coaching level one certificate. Which you have. AFL approved. I'm an AFL approved level one coach, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had a bloke <laughs> who came and he just, it did not compute that I was there doing what I did. Were you the only woman? I was the only woman. Um, no, that's not true. The, the big group, there were was, there was some women there to coach other women. I was the only woman there coaching teenage boys. There were, um, yeah, the rest were, were coaching either mixed teams or just women's teams. And this bloke, just his head exploded when he came and go, oh, g'day. He said, oh, God, there are ladies in the room. There are ladies in the room here to help out the club, here to help out the club. Maybe maybe hand out some sandwiches. No, you're coaching. Yeah, you're coaching. You're coaching. Right, you're coaching. And, and, and you're coaching girls. Coaching girls, coaching girls, coach, 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 coaching boys. Little boys, little boys, little, little teen, teen, teenage boys, right? He just, <laughs> at every level, it just blew his mind. <laughs> and and he also, you know, couldn't believe, you know, he got us as a group. And, oh, oh, fellas. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, lady, lady. Um, I love this man, but I love this was, man, by the way. He was hilarious. I wish you'd brought him along tonight. Uh, that would have been great. He was, look, he was actually wasn't a bad bloke for all of that. He wasn't a bad bloke. But when he when a man answered a question, you go, what's your name, big fella? Good on you, Barry. Where are you from? Good on you, Terralgan. Good on you, Barry from Terralgan. Yeah, well, big round of applause for Barry from Terralgan. And then, and then if a woman answered a question, you go, terrific. And now, um, <laughs> uh, you know, just... All the classic, you know, this is all just too much for me. But then I went home and read the coach's manual, 2012 AFL, pro- AFL approved coach's manual. And in the beginning it says this, if a girl comes to your club, just treat her like she's a person. Hey. Well, we know she's not. But just for the sake of the ease of exchange, just act like she is a human. It'll fuck you up, but just go with it. Trust me. He said that's what it says in the manual. And then it's got a list of coaching players. Yep. Coaching players with a disability. Coaching female players. (laughs) Yeah, in that order, which is nice to know. Um, and, and that's where it tells you how to deal with should a lady turn up at the club. And then it says, as though it's news. Imagine coaching a, coaching a, um, a female with a disability. Where well, would that, be? that anyway, would be altogether too much. That would blow, blow the whole system up. <laughs> it would. Um, but it does tell you what to do in that should that circumstance arise. Um, tell yeah, us, so it, tell us about the course. So two-day course. Two-day course. And yeah, on a weekend, George? Reasonable hours? What are we talking? Uh, it was a whole Wednesday night from sort of 4 till 10 and then a whole Saturday. Um, and, and look, you know, it was good because they focused on the things that I actually cared about. That Once this guy got over the fact that there were women there and, yeah, he couldn't, you know, I've just, oh, my, I've just been teaching a group chess marks with women. <laughs> chess, yeah, we get it. There are bosoms <laughs> on the women. We yeah. get it, you know. They're actually female footballers. They have taken chess marks before, but he just could not get past chess marks. No, but for like women, you know, boobs, you know, women. 
He was obsessed. I, I, yeah. I seriously love him. I'm not getting yeah. you. I really... <laughs> Look, he was passionate about his footy, but what he did say, which was very good, was you can have the best footballer in the world can still be a terrible coach because if you, it's like teaching. You know, you can know as much as you like about physics, but if you don't like little people, don't be there. And the same with coaching. You can be a great footballer, but if you don't like little kids... And, and getting them to grow and expand and enjoy themselves, then you're in the wrong gig. Um, how many weeks into the season are we? We're up to round 12 this weekend. What's the record? And where are you at this time of oh, Look, we've had two losses, which, you know, last week was a disaster. Two losses. It's not bad. It's, fine. it's not bad. But, but the grading rounds are really difficult. Um, so we've, we've, only, we've only been left with six teams to play against, which is a bit of a small competition now. Um, but yeah, look, you know, look, it's a good season. Although having said that, it is school holidays this weekend. We'll be down a few players. Hopefully, the opposition will be too. And uh, yeah, hopefully, we'll be all right. I know. You find yourself going into assistant coach speak when you um, are talking about junior football. Uh, sometimes I do. <laughs> sometimes I do get a bit cliched and uh, and talk about playing the playing the ball, not the man. Um, but you know, we we we. We have a lot of fun with that stuff and it matters. We've had a problem with sledging on our own side recently of kids putting each other down and okay. we had to sit them down and talk about, you know, what, what is motivating, what's not motivating. Being slagged off is not motivating, Sam, as you know, <laughs> given all the slagging on <laughs> Like whenever I well, slag yes. you off, you no. kind of shrink a little. But, yeah, you, you know, do. if I pump your tyres, yeah. you're, you're there to take on the world. Yeah, and so. it's true in footy as well. Like everything that's Sorry, true in life is just, also true you, in footy. You just take me back to that first Eurovision, actually. <laughs> it's reminded me of some lovely emails that I received. Um, what about... Uh, what you? about? What happened? What did people say? Oh, I think that despite the fact that he'd been retired, I think they missed Terry Wogan. Ah, Despite the fact that he yeah. wasn't doing it, which yeah, yeah, that was yeah. that was kind of brought down the whole, the yeah. whole argument. Do you have uh, aspirations for the top yes, job? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> Did you get to finish you that do. question? Yes, no, I no, do. of course you do. Yeah, no, I do. I want to take them to – well, because I do a few drills with them that are a bit different. Like I make them before – sometimes our coach is a bit, a bit late, so I say, all right, boys, what you've got to do is take a ball, run with someone you, never, you don't go to school with, and come back with a new piece of information about that kid. So, you know, and, and it's, it's great. It was great to know that Vincent has a new puppy and they all remember. And then I say, well, that, that, that bit of information is that you find out, we're going to ask you about it at the end of the training session. George, so hold on, George. So I'm, I, I, was a, a little, I was a little junior footballer yeah. and my assistant coach said, go and pick out someone you don't know. Yep. Go for a run with them. Yep. And at the end, you've got to come back and tell me something. Something new. I'm not sure I would have liked you as an well, assistant coach, Well, they George. like it. They do quite – they're under 13s. They have played together since under 10s. Yes. So this is their fourth year together. And what they tend to do now is sort of stick in school groups, which we want to break down a bit. I want them to mix it up and get to know each other. I want them to like each other. They don't, they, they don't know anything about each other. And I've got to assist that because they're boys. You know, they're like border collies trying to have a conversation. That's <laughs> Not a lot gets exchanged. You sound like, like the perfect assistant coach. George. Do you I? Seem, yeah, you seem Thanks, to be Sam. just filling in all the gaps that the head coach may not be providing. Aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And you come in and do that. Yeah, I try. I do my best. I love it. I love it. Um, just quickly, the poli- how has the politics of football um, impacted your junior football club, if at all? Uh, well, not really. It's, it's pretty straightforward. But I've had a good club. I've got a good team, a good group. They've t- trained together for years. The parent group kind of knows each other. So it's pretty smooth sailing, I've got to say. Um, it can get a bit tense. Um, you know, men don't like me telling their sons what to do sometimes. Um, but those men are fuckwits. Um, <laughs> Self-evident, really. Um, you know, and, and uh, because I was a teacher, yeah. I'm used to telling boys what to do. And when I was teaching at 23, I was telling 18 year old I mean, I never thought they'd do it. I was always surprised and actually picked up the piece of paper or put their tie on or whatever. But, yeah, you, you, you know, you have to exercise your authority. And I, I don't know why more women don't coach. I really don't. And I think women in football clubs tend to stick to secretarial roles and the treasury roles, and there is no reason at all why they couldn't be out there on the field, especially if they've watched footy. You know, if they know a little bit about footy, um, I reckon they've got as good a say as anyone else. I'm sure I speak on behalf of every parent in the room tonight with kids that they would love to you to be the assistant Thanks, coach Sam. at their club. Thank you. Uh, 
That's where it sounded sincere, George. Yeah, and, um, no, it did sound sincere, Sam. <laughs> More sincere than you, you wrote. Let's, uh, that was amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. Please, um, we'll get our next guest out here, but please thank George McEncroe for you. that. I move along. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no worries. Microphone in. Yep. And uh, how are you feeling? Do you need any water or anything? Uh, right? No, I'm good. Okay. We feel, we're still rolling? Good. Um, our next guest is a legendary musician. He's a writer. He, the, his um, unexpected passion tonight is described as, as an iconoclast, but I would actually describe him as an iconoclast. Uh, like I said, he is, uh, he is an icon in this uh, town in Australia. He's, um, it makes perfect sense to me to talk to David Graney about explorer Sir Richard Francis Burton. Please welcome Dave Graney up to the stage. <laughs> Hello. Dave, just quickly get it out of the way. Any um, any surgery planned in the next couple of weeks? <laughs> just want to make no. that sure, Dave. No, no, no. Okay. I was found that fascinating. Oh, good. My first f- football coach was very influential in my life. Cause, uh, he was the only guy in town who didn't drink. Oh, really? Was, uh, I still I visited there recently, and I saw him. He's still running because he wow. was a, a professional boxer. And uh, it was very, uh, everybody else, you know, in a pretty working class scene, all you did was get drunk, get right. wasted. And yeah. he, he was a, just an oddity that didn't do that. So. Yeah, wow, well, isn't that amazing? Cared about his fitness and being an example. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. worked uh, cutting up limestone, you know, powerful Burt Lancaster wow. type character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, you, do you remember any uh, specific skills of football that he uh, taught you, Dave? Or is it just the, the actual... Um, he had one of those... Uh, he had lots of football players, you notice, to have, have, have destroyed their voices from, mm. is it from yelling out on the field oh, all the time. I think it's knocks to the larynx. Yeah. Have you ever spoken to Darren yeah. Lockyer? Like, That's how uh, he speaks. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Lee Matthews, very... Yes. Uh, the... the, the uh, the ex uh, Tigers coach is on radio. You could barely hear his voice. Uh, the one who's in the tanning solarium all the time. Terry Wallace. Terry Wallace. Oh, yes. Is he a tanned Terry Wallace? <coughs> oh, he's tanned. He's, he's, he's got his own. He's got his own solarium in, at in his, his house. house. <coughs> <coughs> um, How did I not know that? I'm serious. That's. That, I remember him talking about that. Was part of the charm of why he bought the property. I remember. Yeah. yeah. Not a sauna. Now I'm actually, now I'm hoping that we're not filming this. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yes, it's, it's a wild. known fact. <laughs> as long as you say it's a known fact about anything. Yeah, well. Yeah. It absolves you, I think. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. Well, well, we can talk about Terry Wallace all night, yeah. but um, uh, Dave Graney, why Sir Richard Francis Burton? Well, um, I guess this was called unexpected passions, and uh, it's whether it's unexpected of you or uh, if it was really unexpected or guilty pleasures, you know. Have you ever had people talk about things that are quite shocking? Uh, people come in and say, I'm an expert yeah. on butt plugs or something. <laughs> That's right, that yes. Ever? Well, yeah. we had, uh, t- yeah, Tom, Tom Elliott things. was here and he, just yeah. t- <laughs> oh. he, was, he was tossing up a couple of subjects, but we went with another oh, one. Oh, right, but, okay. um, yeah. No, yeah, it, I think they, they kind of... They blur the lines, don't they, yeah. both? Well, so Richard Francis Burton is an explorer around the 1850s. Uh, is charismatic figure. I got interested in him through various uh, avenues. I lived in London for about five years, and uh, London's a uh, you know, terrifically hard place to live in and uh, periods of, you know, holding down jobs. You'd go to work in the dark, you'd come home at dark and spend most of your time underground. And I've never read so many books in my life, you know. I would churn through three or four books a week, you know, sitting, you know, in cramped uh, close quarters with the rest of the population. And uh, I started to read a lot about... um, I was also from a certain generation music scene who, who were trying to reach back into the 1940s in a way and uh, got fascinated with this. Uh, exp- and I was also felt very much being an expatriate person and, and an experience. 
and an American writer <clears throat> and musician. I, I got to uh, search out his books called Paul Bowles. Paul Bowles, who's from a kind of aristocratic New York milieu, and he went to uh, live in um, Morocco and Tangier in the 1940s when a, a European man could live like a, a king for a dollar a week. And he's, he's a figure that uh, was uh, traced through many of the Beat Generation's writers, and, and they all often went there to pilgrimage to 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 uh, to meet him. And he's he figures in the uh, Naked Lunch, and you know William Burroughs went there to see him. <clears throat> as a fellow who's already dropped out in a way. So <clears throat> his books are all about people who have, uh, who have gone into the desert and they, they face themselves in a way. So uh, I started to read lots of books about him. I was fascinated about them. And, um, and then uh, I saw uh, um, later on <clears throat> uh, a, a movie called Mountains of the Moon, Great movie. I saw that movie too. That brought him to my attention. That was a fabulous film. It's a movie by Bob Raffleson, who made Five Easy Pieces, part of the uh, that generation of late 60s American filmmakers that kind of brought different kind of, uh, not so much youth culture as almost a kind of a blue collar, kind of uh, 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 not, not the kind of, uh, not a mainstream kind of... Uh, they brought different actors in and voices, uh, rather like the kitchen sink movies of the 60s. Mount, a, Mountains of the Moon is a film about Richard Burton, yeah. Bob, mm. Bob Rafferson features a lot in that, in that book, Easy uh, Writers, Raging, Raging Bulls, Bulls, about yeah. the <clears throat> birth of independent cinema in made, the 60s. Made very yeah. few movies, like mm. uh, Terence Malick and uh, if a few others... Um, but uh, very influential. And they're, they're funny characters also, because they came from often the... Uh, Roger Corman School, which was a, like very cheapy uh, movies made for the drive-in scene, with and but a, a very commercial movie making and uh, crass and crude. But he had great actors like uh, uh, Warren Oates and uh, Jack Nicholson, and a, a whole school of American cinema came from there. But the Mountains of the Moon is a is a film about Burton. And uh, it's very, uh, he's a very charismatic character because a lot of the British uh, explorers or people who were fascinated with uh, the Arabian world were strangely uh, you know, uh, public school boys uh, mm. like uh, T.E. Lawrence or uh, even Bruce Chatwin recently, like uh, Effet, uh, strangely, uh, you know, uh, strange uh, sexual. Uh, uh, you know, uh, interests, and uh, the Burton in the film is more like Errol Flynn. He's, yes. he's more uh, more of a man of action. So that, that that was kind of very appealing character. And why was he obsessed with trying to find the source of the Nile? Because that's what Mountains of the Moon is about. Yeah. It's trying to find the source of the Nile. Mountains of the Moon refers to the uh, two large mountains. I think Kilimanjaro, where, where uh, they were obsessed with it, where the Mile, the Nile began. Mm. Because uh, the it's like it's the height of Victorian uh, empire, Victorian power, and they're uh, they're wanting to explain the world, I think, mm. in their way, and uh, and they want to link themselves and their understanding to some sort of biblical world as well. And uh, the Nile, the birth of civilization, they mm. kept finding this uh, you know civilization that had uh, existed before, and and only remnants of it remain mm. in a way. So. Burton went into uh, into uh, Africa uh, in um, in uh, about 1850, 1864 or something to uh, find the the uh, source of the Nile with another character uh, called Speak John Speak and and they they journeyed to find it where the Nile came from. It was a great mystery, rather like explorers here, both English and the, and. German uh, were obsessed with the interior of Australia. Mm. They, they thought there must be a sea in the middle of Australia. They must, and they went to find it. And um, Australia was uh, equally producing, you know, fantasies of, uh, you know, the interior of it. You know, must be there must be something there that that is of value. 
Uh, you're, so you're, you're reading these books, uh, Dave, uh, when you're in London. Why? What actually drew you to to uh, Burton? Is it just the charisma or the, the so many levels of talent that he seems to have had? I, I did have a little bit of research. Uh, well, um, a, a little bit. I, I, I uh, just little things, you know. In life, you know, you accidentally fall on things and. Uh, my wife Claire was playing in this band called The Wilder Shores and we met a lot of people in them, London kind of people. And then I found a book called The Wilder Shores of Love and that was, uh, uh, I was always, London and the UK is great for, was great for secondhand bookshops and those sorts of things. And um, um, in The Wilder Shores of Love, which is a book written by a woman, Leslie Blanche, it's more uh, about the uh, female um, adventurers into that who crossed over in, in the 19th century, there were characters, one called Uida, O-U-I-D-A, and they were women who went in, totally into the Arab world and they were really into the exotic dress. And, and, it, and they, could, uh, they could pass off often as men or, and uh, sometimes, like Isabel Eberhardt, a French uh, explorer, adventurer, they, she totally passed as a man for a lot of her life, uh, took uh, you know lovers of either sex and um, and and one of the women in the book was uh, was Isabel Burton who, who was Richard Burton's wife and the story of them is, is very fascinating because uh, she met him when he was a legend after he'd uh, been to discover the Nile after he'd uh, been the first European man to enter Mecca and Medina he was a legend in anthropology founded the royal uh, one of the founders of the geographical society and she wanted in with this legend in a way she loved him and his his He's story a bit of a Kerouac almost wasn't he a sort mm. of a really cool guy fascinating character dressed with coal around his eyes uh, styled himself <laughs> as the the wickedest man alive before uh, Alastair Crowley but uh, yeah so I found different books leading to this mm-hmm. kind of story and, and the more you found out about it it's a very mysterious story uh, uh, because in the end she possessed him and she possesses him she took so much of his inner life with her in in, in, a, in a way this is Burton's wife Isabel Burton's wife did mm. yes uh, and, and the influence, we know um, h- how that happened, Dave, or what exactly the, the um, kind of journey that that took? Because it started quite differently. Well, there was... Uh, I'll read you some of his uh, books that he published. You have bought a few books here. Oh, he's, uh, he's a character who uh, published a lot of books, and uh, the main one he did... Uh, the books you'd never find in any normal bookshops. They're only in an- antiquarian books. They're very valuable as artefacts. Mm. I'll, I'll read you a list of what he published. And, and this is going to be, I hope, very boring because... Uh, <laughs> because What's this one called? Snow Upon... This is called Snow Upon the Desert, Upon the which Desert. is a reference to the... Uh, the uh, Nile and the uh, the mountains of the moon were snow capped in in a desert environment. You're prefacing this by saying you hope this I'm is hoping very it's boring, very boring Dave. because yep. when you, when you read about Burton or see the movies that you know it's not like going off to explore Africa is something you can do and it's going to take a couple of days. There, there were years mm. and he married Isabel and then immediately left for, for an, an exploration was away for years. Oh, the luck. Like, and, yeah. Yeah. Many I think, people, I think it was like that. Many people yeah. don't know this, Dave, but Isabel went on to assistant coach the under-11s. That's right, what yes. she was doing yeah. at home. She had to do Dan something. She was building the spine. Exactly. Yeah. She had to do something while he was away. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, kick it down the corridor. So, huh? There was only so many oranges she could cut up for uh, <laughs> so many jock straps she could mend. <laughs> So uh, there's a list of his books. I, 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 there's a point to this. So uh, it's, there is uh, Sind, which is an area he loved to visit, S-C-I-N-D. It's sort of a war-torn area, rather like uh, Afghanistan now or, or uh, Pakistan and Indian border. He, he, he wrote books about that. Falconry in the Valley of the Indus, a complete system of bayonet exercise. LAUGHTER 
<laughs> niche topic, sure, it's but great. still you can I find would a market. To, yeah. I would love to find any of these books. Yeah. And, uh, the, this is 1855, Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca, First Footsteps in East Africa, the Lake Regions of Central Africa, The Prairie Traveller, a, ha- a Handbook for Overland Exhibitions, that's one of his American ones, Wanderings in West Africa, A Mission to Galil, King of Dahomey, with notices of the so-called Amazons, the grand customs, the yearly customs, the human sacrifices, the Nile Basin, wit and wisdom from West Africa, and... uh, he, he bo- Did they he, sell these books? Did he was he a popular he, author? He wrote mainly. There's a great thirst for a knowledge of of the world as as these heroic explorers illuminated it. But so all, all that he published it was uh, either he translated uh, poems, epic poems as well. All he published were quite uh, academic, uh, anthropological things. Right. There was nothing really personal of him. Well, there are a couple uh, of exceptions, Dave, in terms of his translations. That uh, he did uh, one called Stone Talk, which is like a, a, a long poem of, well, I've never seen it, but uh, of, of a drunk talking to stones as he falls over face first onto them. <laughs> but uh, he, he was, um, he, he, uh, he translated a lot and... Uh, Later in life, he, he translated A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, which went for 10 volumes, and, uh, and, it, and it's uh, still the main one that you can get today. But it, and then he published six extra volumes of just supplemental notes to it from his knowledge of travelling and sexual, sex, sexuality, uh, sexual practices in mm. the Eastern world, which, which he... he, he he w- he dived into and uh, mad for a share because yeah, his other book yeah, he was yeah didn't do so <laughs> and uh, later later in life he he, be- he became commercially successful with these books published in small print erotic erotic uh, kind of publishing a 50 houses Shades of Grey version of uh, Richard he did Burton. the Kama Sutra and he yeah. did he was working on his final one uh, the uh, which is the perfumed garden. He translated it already from the French, but he was uh, working on an original from the Egyptian language. He, he was a, he was a marvelous Genius. linguist and could learn any language. And uh, Dave, what about his ear? Because that's a scene in the movie. That's a scene in the movie. It's very was early on. Was it true on, yeah. that he that a bug crawled? In, yeah. in the movie, mm. can I? Yes. Yeah, he, mm. he's got this thing that's driving him crazy because he's got this endless scratching around in his ear, and he just takes a knife mm. and plunges it into mm. his ear. Don't do that. Yeah, I right? just yeah. don't get a yeah. cotton tip if you have to go to the doctor. But yeah, and then and then that's so then he sort of his ear hole was then mm. he sort of scrounged yeah. around and. The and movie I hope is, he killed the bug after The movie that. is very, really gruesome in its uh, depiction of, you know... Uh, but he did come back deaf, didn't he, from that? Mm, ex- or at least yeah, yeah, he's full of uh, wounds and, you know, uh, battle scars from his life. Mm. Yeah, and uh, later in life he'd, he'd published these books and, um, and uh, he was working on the perfume garden on, of which he poured everything of himself into it and all his life he'd written books... And uh, it's it's a dramatic end to the story of the the man and the woman. He he was uh, he he he'd written so much, and the thing about her was she came from a very rich Catholic family of England, and she gave him a bit of you know uh, rank in society and money and uh, class and power and. Um, in the end, she she made a bonfire of of his book and all of his journals, everything personal he ever wrote, and that was it. And uh, nothing is known of his inner life; it's only of his outer life and what people said about him. So that that's what I find the most fascinating is of, of a person who is possessed by everybody, but, uh, you know, in a world where we live, where we know the, uh, 
you know, we know things. We know things about c- celebrities that you don't want to know. Mm. And, uh, but this, uh, I find it, you know, uh, very uh, amazing that that struggle between two people of private mm. struggle and for possession of each other is, you know, uh, acted out in a way. And and in the different books, she's portrayed in different ways. Sometime, you know, some of his champions, uh, you know, real savage gay lords who just, uh, you know, call her out for being a harridan and a harpy and all this. But uh, others are are more... um, It's like Oscar Wilde's wife, you know. um, You know, she's always portrayed as, you know, I don't know, you know, some terrible thing <laughs> for yeah. him, you know, but uh, it, it's not the whole truth, really. Would you be comfortable with the, when the time comes that that Claire just took a match to everything that you um, represented oh. that you'd ever written or, uh, or you know, performed, Dave? Would you be comfortable with that? Yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I, mean, I thought so. <laughs> Well, in his will, he, he left everything to her to do with as she liked. Inclu- including a couple yeah. of matches, it would yeah. say. The, um, what about, uh, do you think that the fact that this fascin- that your interest in Burton has, has um, been maintained and your fascination maintained because you're always discovering new things about him, Dave? Is, it, is that how it is? Well... It's one of those funny things. Uh, you often find strands of things that other people touch upon. And I always like the music of the Grateful Dead. And they, one of their greatest tripping instrumentals is called Mountains of the Moon. Mm. So I, I love it when, uh, when, you, when you notice something and then you see uh, little flashes of it elsewhere. Uh, Burton, I don't know... Uh, He's just a fascinating character in that in that kind of way, but it's more of the uh, the story of Isabel uh, Arundel is her her name. It's a very uh, powerful Catholic uh, family in 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 the British upper class society. And what do you make of her? What's your personal take on her? Um, well, she seems quite a modern modern person, and uh, she, she she it's a sort of. Uh, it's like the uh, uh, the way a woman, though a woman in those times especially, had to live through her male partner mm. in a way. There was no avenue uh, for her, in in some ways, to experience that kind of adventure. And no. uh, you read passages of them. They went. She 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 fought for him to get uh, diplomatic. Uh, postings and she got them a posting in Damascus and she wanted to go into his legend herself and they, there they were in the east and they, they came back to the UK and they were dressed totally as, as Arab, Arabs and it was quite, I found that quite touching you know, and she, she, she loved the weirdness as well. And was that part of her burning the diaries, do you think that was part of her sort of wanting to ob- obliterate everything he'd done? Was it an act of jealousy to keep him to herself? or In some ways, uh, yeah, it's often portrayed that uh, she wanted to protect his uh, or her, her, uh, her part or her uh, income or something she could get from his legend. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people saying that, that it was alluding to his uh, homosexual life. And even people are making that up, you know, mm. really they're imagining that. And she was offended by it, and uh, that's why she, she burnt it. But uh, uh, I don't know, she, she, uh, she also said he was a Catholic, you know, as he, as he died, he said he wanted to be a Catholic. So, you know, that was, uh, every, and everybody who, who was against her says it's, that wasn't true either. Hey, how many books of uh, Burton's have you actually read? <laughs> Well, uh, they're, they're difficult to find, and uh, I've read about four biographies. And uh, Michael Ondaatje's brother uh, uh, is a very rich businessman. Put out a, an amazing uh, uh, a book where he 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 recreated one of Burton's journeys in the Sindh Valley. It's it's uh, very uh, like a folly of a rich man, but I, I find that. That, that, that's I find anything about him pretty in, interesting. Because that book that he wrote about his journey to Mecca, mm. like for instance, so can I just read that? Where is it? Is that readily available? 
they're not really readily available. There is a Burton Society. You can find it online. Are and you all a that. member? That Dave's no. the president. Are you? And have you got I, a T-shirt? And a I've badge? often looked for. Uh, <laughs> I've often looked for version or editions of A Thousand and One Arabian Nights yeah. and I've only ever seen one copy and the uh, Australia's beloved uh, uh, singer Paul Kelly has it in his house. It's a family heirloom. Yeah. And, uh, and it is it is 16 uh, like, hi, uh, hide-bound volumes. Wow. And uh, the language is very dense. I have a lot of books from that period. I love the, the Victorian language, but some of them I have just as, you know, uh, objects because the language is impenetrable in, mm. in the Victorian kind of uh, confessional writing, like uh, My Life on the Plains by George Armstrong Custer is is just a paperweight, really, but, you know, it's... Good uh, kindling. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> I have two copies of that. and uh, But I have a book by Jesse James' mother, which is uh, full of invective against the world, and it's uh, it, it, the, the ferocity of her language in defending her son. He was so badly done by the world. When he was, the mothers of criminals are often <laughs> <yes>. like that. <laughs> and uh, Ned Kelly's mother, you know, she was excellent, you know, yeah. you know all that stuff. Family I like that story. come in different shapes and sizes. Yeah. You know, my, <laughs> my parents have tried to pass down the... Uh, uh, the uh, entire Mr. Men series down and oh, there. That's you know. nice. <coughs> I don't know. Nice. Speaking of paperweights, that Mr. Strong. I know. That's not a really. Too much that's you'll not never a, get through this. Not a, it's not a, it's, it's very hard to follow. Um, Dave, yeah. are you, we're going to finish though before hopefully if there's any uh, one with any questions for either of our. Have you got guests pictures? And, Dave's got pictures. We got some yes, pictures. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, forget about <coughs> Unexpected Passions as a monthly event. I tell you, yeah. Dave Graney's slideshow <laughs> is something that I would go to I'm, if you ever do it, Dave. I've got some very, uh, yeah. very uh, you know, bad pictures here, but uh, I, I was in London in the mid 90s and I was. Uh, reading about Burton and he's buried in a in a Catholic cemetery was all I knew and me and Claire Moore and two friends three friends just drove around South London for a day in the rain trudging through cemeteries looking for his his grave and we found it eventually Yay. at the end of the day in the back of this tiny little church in a suburb called Mortlake and uh, we asked the priest, is, yeah, we're looking for Richard Burton's uh, tomb. And he's, and he's really bored. And he goes, what, the actor? We go, they're always looking for the actor here. We know the explorer. Well, there's something around the back, you know, you might be interested in it. And uh, so I, I must read, I have to read something yeah. uh, for you out of this too. Okay. Uh, may, maybe I'll, I'll read it as we, uh, as we finish. Are these lights going to be all right for the slide, do you so think? So here we go. We'll uh, here we go. I think I've got it. We all oh. see that? So at the back of this tiny church, is a, his mausoleum was a Bedouin tent built oh. in stone. And, and it, it, until Isabel died 10 years later, it was open with a gold coffin inside. Wow. And then when she died, it was closed up. And, uh, and it has a ladder which you can climb up and peer inside at the two coffins and that's me proudly up there <laughs> yelling at my friends don't go away i won't be much longer uh, i'll show you this other one and this is my uh, claremore sorry claire and uh, that's the mausoleum in the back of this church i found it uh, it's quite amazing you know it's a very mm. small church and uh, Jeez, your friends don't look that happy. They're not that happy. No, no it's a no, very no, no. wet, they're not drizzling day. day. Yeah, There's, they're not going to London with you, you again. No, thank you, thank you, mates. <laughs> thank you. And uh, this is uh, on the uh, on the outside of. <clears throat> you can't see. It. I'll read this to you. It's very affecting. This is uh, written there. Farewell, <sighs> farewell, dear friend, dear dead hero. The great life is ended, the great perils, the great joys. And he to whom adventures were as toys, who seemed to bear a charm against spear or knife or bullet, now lies silent from all strife. Out yonder where the Austrian eagles poise on Istrian hills, 
But England at the noise of that dreadful fall weeps with the hero's wife. O oh, last and noblest of the errant knights, the English soldier and the Arab sheik, O oh, singer of the East who loved so well, the deathless wonder of the Arabian nights, who touched Camoan's lute and still would seek ever new deeds until the end. Farewell. That's beautiful. That's my half-time address for Mate. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> I've got to lift them. With a, no, that's beautiful. Yes, that I think that charge, is beautiful. Yes. Charge. Hurrah. Charge. Charge, <laughs> you, you little bastards. And if you don't, I'll drag you. No, that is great. That was no, beautiful. Beautiful. Um, one thing we do at the Wheeler Centre is we finish on time, but... If you've got any uh, questions for Dave or George, um, please put your hand up and one of our beautiful ushers will come around with a microphone. If you have anything that you'd like to ask either of them, please, we'd love to hear. Just make sure there's a question mark at the end of the uh, question. <laughs> Jeez, bossy. I know. So. Um, George, I just wanted to know, what do other women at the club think about you being involved? Uh, look, I think, uh, yeah, they're a little bit perplexed, but I think they're kind of okay with it. There are a couple of mums who are a bit standoffish. Others think it's great and really enjoy that there's somebody there who's just going to keep it, you know, that there's less swearing other than what I contribute. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, I think it's just a nicer tone. I think it just, um, yeah, maybe. maybe. Anyone else who put their hand up if you've got a question for... I've got one for you, Dave. Have you ever Mm. considered being a coach of any sporting team in your life? Uh, uh, Well, it was funny. I remember being a kid and the coach giving us the pep talk and Mm. we'd all all be just sitting there going, Jesus. And you've even read actual league football saying, God, they can go on, can't they? they The coach, you know, stirring them up and they're going, oh, God, this is corny bullshit again. Why, know, why, so. can, why is it so easily for me to imagine an under-11s football team with a, with a, a rah-rah coach in the middle and then a little Dave Graney, <laughs> all right, just to the side, with a little moustache and a hat, okay. just nudging, it nudging the player next to me going, jeez, he can go on a bit, can he? I can really oh. see but, that quite easily. But you've, you have many skills that a normal football coach wouldn't have. From Do you reckon? The, yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, reading the audience. The you know. Yeah, timing. <laughs> Timing's everything, guys. Talking in complete sentences, the <laughs> yeah. whole thing, George. Um, <laughs> do you start out with a gag? No, or... <laughs> I do sometimes. I Leave do them sometimes laughing. tease them, but my son said, Mum, don't tease them. Oh. They don't know that you're being funny. Oh, um, you're I said, shut up, you little poof. Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't say that at all. I just said, it's okay. They'll learn that I'm teasing, that we're, that we're joking. But I, you do forget sometimes mm. that you've just got to be very tender with little people. They're just little bubs. They're just really? little bubs. Oh, they look that. I like when you do it. You're so cute. <laughs> there's no, and there's no spitting on tissues and wiping. No, but all oh, I've come close oh, oh, sometimes. Oh. There is a boy I wanted to carry from the field. Yeah. Um, he's so skinny. He's like Kermit the Frog falling yeah. over, you know, just all limp, limp little arms, and I could scoop him up and carry if him. If you are going to do that, if you are going to offer to carry just make sure they're injured first, George, you know what I mean? <laughs> they don't usually like to come off unless they're actually injured. We, um, we were at that game in Sydney last year yeah. when Paul Ruse ran onto the field and right. they, they have those rules about yeah, people running on the field. Yeah, not allowed to run and, onto the field. And he wasn't involved and, and the... Uh, the women involved in the Sydney uh, Newtown mm. Swans are very um, educated, intelligent people mm. who don't back off from his sort of authority. Right. It was right. very interesting. Yeah, it is an interesting thing. It's a very tricky thing. Mm. Um, we've actually had an incident recently where the boy was knocked out and the parents refused to get medical help for him, which was very strange, and kept saying he'll be right, thinking, well, he might, but he won't get his VCE at this rate. <laughs> get the boy to, you know, a yeah. hospital. Um, and we've now changed that rule so that, so that the call to the ambulance is made by the first aider on the mm. field rather than leaving it up to the parents' discretion when they yes. come off. But, but, yeah, it is an interesting thing, that, that temptation to run out after your kid mm. uh, when, they've, when they get knocked out. It is a sickening... Thing and you're reminded, this is what I love about junior football, again, for boys to contain violence, to measure strength and learn about proportionate force mm. and what they can do. And, and actually, I think most kids don't want to 
hurt each other. Um, certainly not to the degree that I'd like. Um, when I'm saying, you know, most of them don't don't actually want to hurt one another. They they you know. Um, they, well, they don't. I mean, occasionally, I think as they get bigger and more testosterone, I mean, we're talking yes. under 13. Yeah, they're yeah. barely a pube amongst them. Yeah. They're little people. <laughs> Not that I'd know, but I'm just saying they're little. Maybe when the testosterone kicks in more, we'll yeah. have more biffo. But at this stage... Sometimes, when I was a little kid playing, if there were shortcuts available, if you're chasing someone, if you could yeah. punch them a bit, right. and then punch them a they bit. would drop in pain and you'd get the ball... <laughs> There are shortcuts available. You did a bit you'd of punching. Take them, I yeah. think this is good for you to hear this, George. Yeah. Just hear someone else with a different perspective yeah. to the one that you've got when you're yeah, in yeah, charge yeah. of these kids. It's just for balance, yeah. Because I keep trying to get them to hit harder, but they oh, won't yes. do it. Yeah. Yeah. Soft. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm oh, look, you do find great things. I mean, I do love it's, the uh, coaches are. Just one is no, there, recently. Is there any sectarian Catholic Protestant well, things you can? Well, we played mix recently. They mm. were very tough. Yeah. And being a former Catholic, <laughs> they were. They're they're dirty. And they think they can go to confession yeah. and wash yeah, all away them, with yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> How do you how, for oh, for dear. for those those in intra club games? That's what they're called. Mm. You know, it used to be. Catholics and Protestants. Then it used to be shirts and skins. What mm. do you do now? Mm. In when we're just we're shirts and skins. Well, no, we still? inside out and mm. and wow. yeah, because the kids that won't take soft. their tops off anymore. Mm. Mm. No, no. It's not with, not with what are the no. fashions that they follow from the AFL? Like the oh, the that's AFL. Stupid. It's Buddy been pointed Franklin. out to me. No one has any body hair on them at all. Well, our boys, I think, would yes, love a bit don't. of body yeah, hair removed. Yeah, they want it. But yeah. yeah, I think no. The biggest, the pro, the one most worrying trend in football, I think, is boys trying to kick around. Oh, instead of doing a long, instead of oh, guiding yes. the ball onto the boot with the oh. hand, they do this stupid Buddy I'd Franklin banana I'd love to be there kick. when you're telling them. Oh, they just yeah. love being told yeah. by me. <laughs> and they say, "Show me," and I go, "No, I'll just get." No, you just, just watch it. Kick it. it. <laughs> Um, but the, I know the how to do thing. it. I've seen it. Yeah. yeah, I've seen enough videos, yeah. and uh, I go and show them how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do well, it. So, but don't do, buddy. Mm. Offered to bring Dave down to the club one week. I'm sure that'll. Uh, I think no, that would no, be great. No, no. I think that would be great. We love a guest speaker. We can go down there and read some Burton to them yeah, on a Thursday sorry, night. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Fire them up. Yeah. We, had, we had a fabulous... I have to be in complete Arab dress, though. <laughs> that's, as long as that's okay. They would, they would dig that. That's you can a, do, that's a, you that's can do good... that with a bath towel, actually. Really? Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 That could be one of the greatest pie nights in the history mm. of junior football, mm. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Graney in, in a um, reading from Burton. Can yeah. I just thank, on behalf of everyone, to you two, thank you so much because you've just, you've beautifully captured what this... A night is supposed to be about unexpected passions. Dave Graney, George McEnroe, and everyone here. Thank you so much Thank for you. the evening. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And, um, just a big thank you to everyone at the Wheeler Centre, Richie and Seb and all the guys. Just uh, thank you so much. And just once again, thank you all for coming and I uh, hope to see you at the next one. Thanks a lot. Thank you.